The views and opinions of this program are those of the host guests and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. For over 95 years, we've set the bar. Power, we restored it. Protection, we reinvented it. Record yields, we redefined it. If there's one thing we know at FS, it's that just because something hasn't been done, doesn't mean it can't be done. We're never satisfied unless we take your farming operation to the next level. Run your equipment at peak efficiency and bust the bins this season. Visit fssystem.com. Well, I can't believe I'm saying this, but two days in a row, strong days in the wheat trade led by Kansas City HRW Wheat. Double-digit gains seen there on the day Wednesday. Quarter beans, though, didn't get much spillover support. In fact, we really didn't do anything at quarter soybeans on Wednesday. While we continued our cattle rally off the uh, wild, volatile trade we've seen the last couple of days to the downside, we're going to talk about all that and more. Joining us today for market analysis, Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. And Mike, hope you had a great Thanksgiving. And uh, looking at these markets now post-holiday, some interesting nuggets here. It's It's been a... Um, been an interesting couple of days. I guess that's the only word I could really come up with here for this market trade, Mike. Yeah, the volatility was as crazy as we were fearing it would be, if not more, Jesse. I think that was the number one takeaway as we came back from the weekend, especially Monday's trade, where it seemed as though um, something came out of nowhere that totally destroyed the wheat charts and the wheat technicals and really left me thinking, where is that demand low? And where is the market in terms of worrying about Black Sea supplies, Australian supplies, Argentine supplies? Why is it breaking so hard? And I, I think it really did come down to one piece of news that was kind of wrapped up within um, a surge to the downside again on Sunday night and, and Monday's trade as well in the Chinese hog futures. They were the leader to the downside before the wheat broke. And so when I was talking to clients on Sunday night, I said, you know, I like everything except what's going on in the Chinese hog market. I don't know what's going on there, but this gives me pause and concern about the uh, market action Monday. <clears throat> Came to find out Monday midday that Chinese wheat buyers reportedly were asking French uh, uh, contractors who they had purchased the wheat from to push their purchases out maybe as much as two months. And I was hearing one, one and a half million metric tons. And so it was a big amount. It was our biggest you know, commodity buyer as a whole, uh, even though Mexico's really come on here the last couple of years. Um, but it really, I think, shook the earth, especially with the hog market um, in, in, in China also taking a big hit, uh, really shook the earth of the longs and the demand bulls especially. And I think what it did was took out a lot, if not almost all, of the longs that jumped in after the U.S.-China meeting. That thaw in relations it seemed to give us a bump. The trade started to buy into the grains again, and I think they jumped right back out again. So that helps explain the volatility. And then today and yesterday's turnaround is, is also explained with some fresh fundamentals. Yeah, let's uh, let's dive into this wheat chart a little bit, the HRW uh, monthly chart, and always enjoy uh, when we have our weekly conversation and the charts you provide us. So walk me through just kind of what you're seeing here. I, I see a lot of lines on this chart, a lot of activity and that volatility we've seen the last couple of days, especially in KC wheat here, Mike. Yeah, the first thing I call your attention to is the bars in this chart. And you notice the last bar has turned from red to black. We've essentially rallied off the lows from just two days ago by over 50 cents. We are now closing out the month of November with just a couple days left now, only one day left actually, uh, with this market now higher on the month. That's a big deal to me, Jesse, especially given that we've been able to do this in such a decent amount of volume underneath us. And you notice also right where that black bar is in our last price trade uh, Wednesday afternoon around 640 in the hard red futures, that as we go into December delivery now, Wednesday night, this is going to become a big issue with the cash market, and the futures market, and that white wedge, that white pennant or wedge that is formed right on this month's price action. So what I'm looking at right now, and when I add to the bottom of the chart, 
the potential buy signal in the stochastics with the purple line coming in and crossing over, trying to cross over the green line down there in the bottom right hand uh, part of the chart in the corner. If that follows through with the buy signal after this week and we cross into December, then the purple uh, uh, wedge becomes a longer term target price potentially because we broke lower prematurely about four or five months ago. So that's the big picture heading into 2024 when it comes to the hard red wheat. This is purely technicals. We don't know what fundamentals would get us back up above $8 and up towards eight and a quarter where that purple wedge point is right now. Well, winter wheat condition looking good here this past week, too, in the U.S., 50%, uh, good, excellent ratings. And so we're we'll watching winter wheat here moving forward. Now, we've seen this good strength in KC wheat. We've also seen strength in Chicago and Minneapolis futures, but I haven't really seen the wheat pull the corn higher at all. So let's look at this chart, looking at SRW and corn. Walk me through what you're seeing here. Maybe you can make some more sense of this for me, Mike, because, you know, with wheat rallying, corn's not doing anything. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and this is one of the neatest charts that I've created. It's an annual chart going back to 1973 of the annual prices, high, low opening and closing for corn and soft red wheat. And then the 10 year moving averages for those uh, two complexes. And you're right, the wheat market, after having six straight years higher, which going all the way back to 1973, we'd never done that before. We are taking a pause and going lower. And we did eat into fresh three plus year lows in the soft red wheat. And so that has naturally helped pull the corn down. And we can see that we've had five straight years in a row, higher prices until this year when it came to the corn market. Again, never seeing that since. 1973. So we were really running hot. We figured this year would probably be lower, but I think what helps explain the big break in the corn is the fact that the soft red wheat has taken such a big hit and has fallen so much. So this brings us to the 10 year averages, these moving averages in blue. We've gone below it in the soft red wheat. We're trying to get back up above it though, as we close out the year. I think that would be extremely important to hold the uh, 10 year moving average in the corn at around 442, not to have to go through that. So that's one of the big things that I'm watching, especially with delivery upon us in the December futures, as I said a minute ago, Jesse. I, I would also throw in there when you look at this chart, you look at the hard red wheat chart, what is the one thing that you and I have talked about other than China that could give us that move to the upside and kind of salvage these prices? And it's really about the bonds, it's really about the interest rates. And with today's GDP number so strong, it didn't give the bond market pause from its rally. And I thought that was very, very interesting. In other words, we're seeing the bonds go up and that's taking the, the interest rates down now. And I think that could help fuel that commodity investment, that commodity buying that you and I have been talking about probably for almost six months at this point. Mm -hmm. That's a very, very great point. On the corn side, I want to ask you, too, I know we've set new lows in March corn. We did finish with a little bit of green on Wednesday in March corn. D's corn just broke the 450 number on Wednesday as we're going into delivery. Are you worried about more downside pressure in this corn market as seemingly there just isn't a story right now in corn? Yeah, I really am. If we have heavy deliveries, I think that's the next shoe to drop. Two big things coming up here in the next five days is going to be the deliveries, which, as I said, they're right upon us now. If we have heavy deliveries, we got to remember, like we talked about last week, it's seller's option. That means the seller has the decision to make that he thinks the mercantile price is better than the cash price out there. And in some locations, as we've spoken about before, that is indeed the case. So if we have heavy deliveries, that means the mercantile price, I think it means anyway, that the mercantile price is too expensive to the cash and it needs to go lower. And so that's why I don't want to see heavy deliveries in the corn the first couple days of, of the process. And, and, and if that doesn't happen and we've actually made a demand low in the wheat, and why would we be making a demand low in the wheat? because we've seen the Russian price come up, we've seen the Ukrainian price come up, 
We've seen Morocco come in and reportedly buy anywhere from 120 to 150,000 metric tons of French wheat for right away delivery. Um, we're starting to see some of the mechanisms. Finally, the gears kind of unseize and start to move again that maybe we're in the midst of a demand low now in this wheat. So that's the biggest issue that we have to face is the wheat was the leader to the downside for the past three, five months. Does corn then take over that, unfortunately, that mantle and that leadership role to the downside the next month? So this is where I think the very short term, along with that OPEC meeting and the help from the crude oil market, we really need those things to come together right here, right now. We are having a conversation today with Mike Zuzalo from Global Commodity Analytics. And Mike, you uh, mentioned the crude oil market. Let's talk about that a little bit here as well and that OPEC meeting. And uh, walk us through this next chart. I'll pull up on our video feed, the uh, weekly WTI chart. Uh, what is going on right now in crude? What are you keeping your eyes on as we wait to find out what OPEC's going to decide here with their Thursday meeting? Yeah, I think the the... the mindset that I would have right now and kind of the whispers that I hear right now is that Saudi Arabia wants to keep the pressure to the upside on prices and keep the supply cuts intact all the way through the winter time, Jesse. And that's their goal in this weekend's meeting that, that was delayed by a week. What we see in this chart is kind of the market giving way from the news um, that the Middle Eastern war was not going to expand. And so we've pulled premium out there. We've pulled longs out of this market there as well. And I think then you also had the break to the downside because the OPEC meeting was indeed pushed out. And there, there, there was thought that there wasn't agreement and that countries like Iran and Russia were going to keep pumping up the volume and not go with Saudi Arabia. So we've now gone back down to that $70, $75 level support that really has been a good support level, plus or minus three, four dollars most of 2023. And you notice that 52 week moving average, we've tried now three weeks in a row to get back up above it after falling below it last month. We haven't been able to do that. If we can get back up above that 52 week moving average after the OPEC meeting, I think we may be back toward going towards the old channel and the and regain our uptrend because tightening supplies with the kind of growth we just saw from the GDP numbers would make me think the trade would be ready to come in and buy this market again. And I would also say that I think things are heating up again between Russia and Ukraine. Even though we're going into winter, it sure seems like Russia is trying to provoke more and more. So that could become a bigger war again as well. So that's kind of the chart look mixed in with the fundamentals on, on the crude oil market. Okay. All right. Good stuff. I should ask on the soy complex real quick, and I think crude could maybe tie in there a little bit. We've seen decent product strength in oil and soy oil and soybean meal, uh, beans. So we bounced off the 200-day moving average early in the week. A any thoughts overall, even though it was a kind of a quiet day Wednesday in the soy complex, any thoughts in soybeans right now? You know, generally speaking, I would say you're right. The bean oil market's been most of the reason why we've been able to go up. The, the meal has kind of cooled off. It looks a little bit dangerous on its weekly chart for a break below a moving average. Uh, I think the big thing for me right now, Jesse, goes back to the bean market going to 1350, stalling out again. It just said to me again that it needs the wheat and the corn on its side to be able to break through that 1350 level on a weekly close. If we can do that, then I think we have another 30 to 50 cents upside, technically speaking. And, and I think fundamentally speaking, we can as well because the soybean planting progress at 75% as of Conab's numbers this morning, that's behind 86% a year ago. That's the slowest in eight years. And so this goes back to the idea that the beans are carrying some premium, but maybe not enough if the weather gets worse again. And I'll jump back over into the corn. The corn market with the first crop corn planting at 55% right now versus 69% a year ago, it has zero premium. As you said, we just went through 450. We have no South American weather premium in that corn market, if you ask me. And we have the funds, the managed money funds, at a 40-month high in terms of their net short position. They're back to that 185,000-plus net short position in the corn. So I really think that if the beans are going to go higher, it needs the corn, it needs the wheat. If we don't see that and we don't break through 1350, I may turn into a hedger once again. 
All right, let's go over to the protein sector. I got uh, a couple charts from you, a cash cattle and a cash hog chart. And uh, let's start with cattle. And, you know, Mike, uh, I didn't even buy a ticket to the uh, roller coaster ride in this cattle market <laughs> in futures the last couple of days. But, hey, uh, we were stuck on it. What a wild, wild trade. Friday, Monday, uh, losing a lot, especially in feeder cattle. Then you come back Tuesday and Wednesday, and uh, we, we gained some back. So, Try to make sense of this to me. What have you been seeing in this cattle market here? And then walk us through this chart as well. Well, we, we finally, and I think we've come to the, the the point where we've done enough in terms of taking premium out because it's similar to the soybeans. When you run a market so red hot on tight supplies and strong demand, you better not lose any of your demand. And I think that's where the cattle market got ahead of itself with a strong dollar and the strong dollar brought in imports. In fact, USDA just made the announcement that the 2024 beef import forecast that they have, I think it's around 3.7 billion pounds, Jesse. They're expecting that to be a record. And this year in 2023 is going to be one of the top five in history as well as far as beef imports. We're also bringing in a lot of feeder cattle from Mexico right now. We're bringing in fat cattle and calves as well from Canada. So I hope that when I give you those illustrations and the, and the viewer those illustrations, you can appreciate more the currencies and the dollar and the impact the dollar could have either favorable or unfavorable in 2024 when it comes to the beef sector and the pork sector especially. But this chart would suggest to me that we've done enough damage for right now. This is a negotiated cash cattle trade. Um, I believe it's FOB that I did. It's not delivered. I believe it's FOB. But it's running around, and that's your that's your white line. That's going to be on the left hand side, running about one seventy four seventy three. Meanwhile, we've got the CME cattle futures, which is your bar chart, running just under one seventy two after Wednesday's trade. Now, I'll call your attention. And this is not a forecast, but I'll call your attention to the price action just below the CME cattle futures tag or title. Right below that, you see a gap in that chart at about one eighty two one eighty three. There are gaps in the D's fat cattle chart and the Feb fat cattle charts up higher, like several dollars higher, just like this chart is showing. And I think that is a target price for lead month futures at some point. And maybe it won't be December, but I think the D's and uh, maybe won't be it. But I think maybe the Feb and the April could be the target prices. So I'm out of all my hedges at this point, waiting for more news and especially waiting for the hogs and pigs report and the uh, January biannual cattle numbers. All right. Good thoughts there. I'm going to flip charts to a cash hog chart here. And I, I think hogs as well have had a, a decent amount of spillover influence from this cattle market here in the last few sessions, whether it be down or back higher. Talk to me about this hog market right now, Mike. I'm going to assume the seasonals are intact and that the hams are making a low because of the Christmas holiday push. I still think beef's going to have a good uh, Christmas. USDA doesn't believe that. They think prices are too high. I think people are, consumers are worn out of the pork and, and to a lesser degree, the poultry, but especially the pork. Having said that, if the ham seasonal is intact and we're going higher in the hams, here again, we have a similar look. We have a lean hog index, the cash index from the Merck in orange. It's at 72. Your lead month futures in the Ds, which is going to go off in the middle of the month next month, left-hand side of the, the chart running at 69. So you've got a discount in the futures compared to the cash. If the ham seasonal is intact, I think the cash market's solid. That would suggest the Ds hogs have some support to them. I, having said that, I don't like the fact that the February hogs are running away from the December. So I'm going to be watching mm -hmm. that very, very carefully. All right. Well, as we look to wrap things up here today, uh, always great stuff. A anything final you could think of you want to mention or reiterate in terms of, of the grain or the livestock trade right now as we're taking a look at things as we wrap up the month of November? You know, I've really tried the last two weeks, especially Jesse, to focus on some of the bigger picture things like the Chinese trade issues with the United States and that thaw. I've tried to focus on the dollar and the bonds and the Federal Reserve neutralizing itself. I think the trade's picking up on what we've talked about, that they believe now the Fed is going to be neutral because we are slowing down economically here and around the globe. 
I really think the timing is coming in now. As I said a couple of weeks ago, I'm the most optimistic I've been probably in six months that these headwinds are at least not going to be headwinds as we get ready for 2024. So I'm right in the middle of crunch time. So please pick up a trial, pick up a subscription. I think it'd be worth your while to keep track of this time period for not just your 2023 hedges, but the going into the 2024 time period. Where could folks pick up that subscription, check out your analysis, and uh, get a hold of you with questions, Mike? Yeah, best place is go to globalcomresearch.com, a globalcom with two Ms, research.com. Product services on there. Trial subscription is on there to uh, get signed up for, and also my toll-free number is on there. So if you need to call, talk to me something specifically, just go to that website and take a look. Fantastic. Mike Zuzalo, Global Commodity Analytics. Always a pleasure, sir. Thanks for joining us this week, and we will talk to you again next week. Appreciate it, Jesse. Appreciate you having me. And that's going to do it for Market Talk today. Find us online at markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.